Almost 15 years ago, I was teaching mathematics to a bunch of children at one of the shelter homes of Salam Balak Trust. Their stories and struggles of life on the streets had a profound impact on me. Leaving my fully funded PhD and a lecturership job behind, I came to the UK to do a second master's in mathematics and, and get a job in banking. Co-founded Friends of Salam Balak Trust with Nick Thompson, and over the last decade or so, we have been working to raise funds and awareness for the betterment of the lives of those three children. Please join us on this journey. Salam Balak Trust set out in 1989 to extend complete support to these homeless children. At the SBT centers, we provide unique and holistic services. We provide children with a roof over their heads. We help children return to their families. We help educate our children by helping them get into school. We provide nutrition and medical support. We help boost the overall mental health and growth of every child. We play games and have fun. We help put smile on our children's faces. We are both proud and humbled by the three decades we have invested in transforming lives. About 15 years ago, I went to Delhi for the first time and I went on a walk led by a former street child through New Delhi Station and the areas around it. Um, and it was eye opening, uh, to put it mildly. Um, it was an extraordinary insight into a, a, a brutal and harsh reality uh, that, the, that my young guide had lived himself and that other people were still experiencing but it was also amazing in a much more positive sense um in terms of the the fluency and energy and 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 vitality that that this young man showed um and that was my introduction to, to salam balak trust which was the organization that uh, he had gone through to 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 learn his english and his communication skills and then i learned through the trust um how many other similarly amazing stories there were uh, so we are now headed into our last session of the festival. I hope all of you have enjoyed these three days as much as we've enjoyed putting it together, bringing it back live uh, to London. Uh, for those, all of our, our wonderful viewers online, thank you for joining us. These sessions from the other two venues will also be uh, put out onto our website and our YouTube channels over the next few weeks, so you'll get to be You'll be able to get to see those sessions that you were torn with wanting to see as opposed to coming to see something else. So it'll all be up there. Just to say a very big thank you to each one of you for being here with us. Um, it really makes it special to be back live. To our colleagues uh, at the British uh, Library, uh, thank you all for your support, our wonderful technical crew, our filming crew, our volunteers, uh, Roly, um, uh, Jamie, uh, John, Conrad, B, and all of the British Library for helping out. My own colleagues at Teamwork Arts who have labored against all odds, especially for this festival, to make this happen. Our programming team, Kritika and Neha, and of course our producer, Sharupa, Sam, and all our colleagues back at home. So on behalf of Namitha Gokhale and William Dalrymple, just to record our, our deepest um, appreciation uh, to most importantly, our sponsors who made this possible. It's been, like I said in the opening, very, very difficult. Uh, but we'd like to thank the Rothschild Foundation, the Rajasthan Tourism, Haldi Ram, the British Council, uh, Chorangi, who gave us that fabulous, for those of you who attended the opening reception, absolutely fabulous food. Uh, the Kamini and Windy Banga Family Trust that supports the Voices of Faith series, which happens across and over the year. The Aga Khan Foundation has been our very old partners. Here and now, 365, uh, the Great Scotland Yard Hotel. Uh, it's a lovely hotel tucked away uh, in Charing Cross. Uh, it is Scotland Yard, so it's, it's lovely. Uh, the Gainsborough Hotel, where much of our colleagues now stay. Cobra Beer for keeping us uh, <clears throat> not parched and hydrated. And our charity partners, Friends of Salam Balak Trust, Salam Balak Trust is an organization that I helped set up 33 years ago, helping uh, to look after street and working children who don't have the opportunity that all of us have of, of good schools, of uh, a hot meal, of a safe space to sleep and perchance to dream. 
So Salam Balak Trust reaches out. We look after about nine and a half thousand children every year. And many of our kids, we use the arts as a way to be able to uh, rehabilitate them and mainstream them. And many of our kids have gone on to be enormously successful. And our belief is that you provide a platform to young people anywhere in the world, irrespective of their disability or their problems or their challenges, and they shine. And that's what we do. So if any of you are interested in the information, just go on to Salam Balak Trust Delhi, and you'll see all the information. Today, uh, our closing session, we're going to be in two parts. The first is I'm going to be in conversation with the incredible Remo Fernandez, who we've got all the way here uh, to be with us and perhaps sing as well. And that's going to be for 40 minutes, and then we'll do a 10-minute Q&A, and then we'll invite Shashi to round it up with a stand-up performance, uh, which I hope will not get us all uh, in trouble. And that's how we're going to close the evening. So because we're not going to do any thank yous at the end, just wanted to say deepest appreciation. And thank you all for joining us. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the superstar, Remo Fernandez. Uh, So a book, a book, Remo's book. As many of you know, Remo has written this spectacular biography uh, of his life and times. And it's really a no holes biography. And what it does in many ways is it takes us uh, through Goa before it became part of India. Goa was a Portuguese colony. And we're going to touch a little bit about that in the beginning. Uh, Remo lived through some of that and they went off to seal him to escape what they thought was going to be bombings. Uh, but also the incredible journey that he's had across hitchhiking, across Europe, uh, serendipity, meeting him in different places, and of course the amazing music that he's been able to create, but very specifically create music which has been part of his soul. So, Remo, thank you so much for A, writing the book and giving us that insight into your world, and perhaps you can start by just telling us how come you decided to put all of this down on a piece of paper. Yes, I'll do that, Sanjay, but uh, before I do that, I want to say a big thank you for inviting me here, and uh, I've always been a musician who also loved writing and drawing, but frankly, I never ever thought that, that I would be attending festivals like the Jaipur Literature Festival in Jaipur, so many festivals that I did in India this year, and this one, the JLF in London, under the, the title of author. I never thought I'd do that, but here I am <laughs> with a book under my belt, and uh, yes. And I want to tell you that I'm very privileged to be in conversation with this man, because he's, he's one of the rare interviewers that I've seen lately, who speaks less than the people that he interviews. <laughs> you know? That's a great quality. I think that's a great quality that he has to just say one sentence and trigger off uh, his interviewee into, into memories and uh, into speaking, into talking, in short. So what was your question again, Sanjay? Sorry. <laughs> What made you want to write this book? You've written music, uh, you've drawn. What made you want to write the book? Okay. Uh, I read uh, many books that were written about Goa of the olden days, of the days when I was a kid in Goa. And uh, Goa has always been, or, or has been in the past, a place that many Goans were embarrassed to say they were from. And... Uh, a lot of famous Goans who lived in Delhi or Calcutta or Bangalore or uh, Mumbai changed their surnames and their names and anglicized them to hide their Goanness. You know, for example, you see two Punjabis meeting anywhere in India or in the world, or you see two, two people from Kerala meeting anywhere, two people from Rajasthan, and they'll all speak in their own, in their own mother tongue. But most of the time, there used to be a time when you saw two Goans and they would speak in English, however bad it was. 
it would be English. You know, what man, how you are, how are you man? And you know, that kind of thing, except Konkani, the, the language of Goa. When Goa became a fashionable destination for the whole world, a lot of these Goans uh, rediscovered their roots and uh, were, were, were proud to be called Goans. And they had not grown up in Goa, but they wrote about the Goa that they never knew, really, as children. And I couldn't find the Goa that I knew later, you know, that I knew from birth, sorry, in these books. And that's one of the reasons why I felt like writing about, and I started off with just a few chapters about my youth, about my childhood in Goa. And uh, before I knew it, it became a whole book, but uh, there was a gap in between because I was busy with other things. And, uh, but, uh, you know, when I was finishing, it was amazing to, to, you know, to have it signed to a publisher like HarperCollins in India. And, uh, and my publisher, Udayan Mitra, who also edited my book, suggested almost towards the end that I uh, write a song about writing the book. And I, and I told him that I can't write a song on commission you know, or on suggestion. I can't do that unless it's a film song or something where I've got to write what the hero feels for the heroine. That's easier because it's not about what I feel about something. What I feel has to come only when I feel it, right? But uh, curiously, on, on the very day after I sent in the manuscript of the book, this whole song came to mind, came to my heart, and I wrote it. So if I may, I'll answer your question with uh, a song. verse. song. What just, better way to answer okay, the Okay, just, just one verse of that song. Can I have more guitar, please? Almost as loud as my voice, the same, the same volume, that's the mix I like. I tried to fit my life into a hundred thousand words. But even a hundred zillion wouldn't have been enough I tried to cut my story short But it's a thought I had to abort Oh, I didn't write off the cuff Cause I didn't wish to bluff For words are little birds You never know where they'll fly And what memories they'll pick up the way they're never follow terms they're prone to dig up worms or to sing a song and brighten up your day fly away fly away fly into the sky
Thank you. Remo, your own training has not really been in music, right? Not <laughs> Sorry. I was told that music was a very good uh, uh, pastime, entertainment, something to be done socially in the evenings at parties, but that I needed a respectable profession to work in. And uh, when I was a kid, there was this cousin who came back from England, and uh, the whole family made a huge fuss. In architect, you know, everybody spoke Portuguese in Goa, right? So I asked them, why, uh, why is it so important that cousin Garcia has is uh, being made such a fuss over. Oh, he's an architect. He's going to architect of the Londres. Uh, he came back as an architect trained in London. And I said, what does an architect do? They told me, he designs houses. Designs? Design is drawing, and I love drawing. I said, I also want to be fussed over. Is the, if that's a respectable profession, well, that's what I'll do. I'll, I'll, I'll draw houses. And... Uh, I don't know why, it was a very silly reason, I guess. That obsession with, be, with being an architect stayed with me right until I finished high school and I joined architecture. And it's only at the age of 18, when I was midway through the course, that I achieved the, I reached the age of reason, I guess. It's not for, not, it's not for nothing that they say that adulthood is declared at 18. When I turned 18, I made a few decisions in life and I said, I want to only work in things I love doing, you know, and there's nothing I love more than music. So why am I studying architecture? I wrote to my father saying, I've seen clearly, father, I'm not going to work as an architect ever. So let me finish with this torture and come back to Goa. I was in Bombay, which I hated every day of my life because it was so different from Goa. I started appreciating you know, Mumbai much later. But at that time, as a... Uh, as a school kid just out of Goa, out of pristine, paradisical Goa, I just couldn't stand the, the crowds and the filth and, and the disorder of Bombay, I guess. And, uh, but my father gave me very wise advice, not an order. If it had been an order, I think I might have rebelled and, uh, and done just the opposite. But he said, you know, son, you've already finished three years of the course. There's only two more to go. So I, was, I would advise you to complete the course because otherwise you're going to feel, you know, like an incomplete man. The day your music doesn't work, you're going to regret not having completed the course. So I suggest you, you complete the course and then do what you like. You know, go into music, go into become an astronaut, do whatever you want to. Uh, and I, and I thought that was a very wise thing to say, so I completed the course without having my heart into it anymore. And I do have an architecture degree somewhere, uh, uh, moth-eaten of course, but it's there. And I published a, a photograph of that moth-eaten degree in the book. But Remo, pretty much when you were, even in school, you know, you were part of this boy band and that you know, the bands in that time was, like he said, entertainment, weddings, social occasions. But there was this one occasion which became magical, and you had everybody, including the elders, get out there and shake their booty, so to speak. Yes. Uh, before that, I must correct you and tell you that we never played at weddings because the, the worst crime we could commit it commit at that time was to charge for a performance. You know? <laughs> we just performed as uh, amateurs, especially when we were school kids. So uh, it was always a recitish. The, they were like uh, you know, concerts that were held at the local clubs for the members social of the clubs. Social events. Yeah, social events. And uh, yes, I had this group. I had this group and, uh, and I had this friend called Alexandre de Rosario. And uh, we had never heard the word improvisation. We didn't know what it was at that time. The thing to do, and, and it still is for a lot of musicians and a lot of bands, is to copy a record as faithfully as possible. Try and reproduce it as faithfully as possible on stage. So you sing a little song, you try to sound like John Lennon, you try to sound like Paul McCartney, you try to play like George Harrison, try to, to drum like uh, Ringo Starr, and everything was as per the record. 
And his friend and I started singing this song called La Bamba, which had just come out, the version by Three Lopez had just come out at that time. I'm talking about the 1960s, okay? The, the version, so, so that you can place what and where I'm talking about. Uh, and we started to sing La Bamba, and uh, towards the latter part of the song, we couldn't stop. We couldn't stop. And uh, the ah, 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 ah part was repeated again and again, and again we would go into ba la 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 bamba. And, uh, and he would say bamba, bamba. And I kept improvising over, th over, over that. And then I kept singing bamba, bamba, and he kept improvising over that. And like I told you, we never heard about the word improvising. The Goan society, the Panjim society who was sitting in the audience, had never heard of an improvisation either. And what was happening on that evening was like sheer magic. We didn't know what was happening either. You know, it, and uh, not only the youth at the back, but even the the people in suits in the front. Uh, I, and I don't really mean you, but uh, <laughs> they too were clapping and singing along, and it was wonderful. So I, I think that's the magical moment you were talking about. And of course, you go on and you start writing your own music. We'll come back to college in a second, but. Uh, there's this one incident that you write in the book where you're all set, you've got these two or three songs and you go to a recording studio, which earlier used to be all set to do classical music and they stuck three mics in front of you. Yeah. Well, I started writing songs when I was in school in Goa and then when I moved to Bombay to study, to faithfully study architecture, uh, I joined a band called The Savages and they were a recording band. I mean, they had that hallowed piece of vinyl called a record. They made records, which was, if you made records in India at that time, you were sitting at the right hand of God the Father, and you know, and I was joining that band. And uh, so we went to record our songs, uh, not our songs, we were commissioned to record four songs out of which they chose two of my compositions. And uh, we walked into the studio, four guys with jeans and t-shirts and long hair for that time and beads and stuff like that. And at the mixing desk was this gentleman in a dhoti and a kurta, immaculate, uh, immaculately white stuff, who stuck two huge mics. And he said, this one is for the bass guitarist and the drummer. And this huge mic here is for the lead guitarist and the organist. And uh, yeah, who's going to sing the song? Okay, you're going to get an individual mic for your, for your voice. And we told him, uh, sir, this is not the way that rock music should be recorded. We need to have mics for each instrumentalist. Uh, you know, several mics, in, in fact, for the drums, one mic for each instrumentalist. He spit his pan into his spittoon, which was like 10 meters away, accurately. And he turned to us with a face which was enough to put fear into anybody. He said, I've been recording Shankar Jai Kisan for the last 25 years. And you hippies want to teach me my job. <laughs> we tried to tell him that this was not film music, especially not film music of the 60s, you know, and 70s. This, you know. But there was nothing we could do. And we had to record that record in that way. And uh, I was so proud to have a record. I was looking forward to having a record of my own. And we recorded it, and I went home for the next holidays. And before I even showed it to my friends, I broke it. <laughs> I'm ashamed to say I, I broke it, because I could not stand the sound of that recording. And uh, I re-recorded those compositions of mine recently. By the way, I must tell you that uh, whenever I have read the autobiography or the biography of a musician, I've always wanted to listen to the, you know, to his music simultaneously. So I always had to go and Google it nowadays, Google it, look for it before I had to, you know, go to record shops, buy cassettes, or whatever. So I decided to, to put together a, a playlist on Spotify, a free playlist, by the way. You don't have to pay to listen to that. You only have to pay to buy the book, that's it. No additional hidden costs, yeah. Uh, and in that, there are 25 songs, at least by now, maybe a few more, which are, spoken, which are written about in the book. 
in the order in which they feature in the book. And some of them, my earlier songs, which I wrote when I was in school, I had never recorded them. So together with, with writing this book, which was such you know, sheer nostalgia, there was also the fact that I was you know, revisiting those old songs and recording them. So the whole thing was a wonderful trip into the past for me. And of course, many years later, you landed up at Abbey Road, where you recorded. No, I didn't record. I just, I just, I just walked across the road, and I, <laughs> I got a photograph clicked while I was walking across the zebra crossing. That's all. <laughs> you know, you, you were already becoming somebody who was well known in the Bombay music scene, and yet, in many ways, you gave up all of that, and you said, "Okay, I'm going to now give up all of this, all my stuff in Goa." And you decided to go to Europe. Yes, I was a, I was a student. I, I was known in the Bombay scene, in the very underground kind of Bombay scene, you know, the, the college, university scene, uh, where we had all those fests and festivals and, uh, and college days. And there were a group of us who later on became more known, uh, you know, better known musicians of, of India. And uh, yeah, but as soon as I finished my architecture course, I wanted to travel and see the world. You know, that was the, one of the main things I was passionate about. And uh, my father suggested buying me a round the world ticket, uh, a three month tour with a few weeks in each uh, important country or whatever. But that's not the way I wanted to see it. I had met so many European youth who had come to Goa and who were living on the beaches. Some people call them hippies. And, uh, they themselves called themselves freaks. They, they preferred the word freaks somehow. And, uh, and it was very much in keeping with my thinking at that time, my age. I was just out of college in my early 20s and, uh, and I wanted to be a gone hippie in Europe. <laughs> you know, that's the way that I wanted to see Europe. Not on a all paid trip with hotels and everything arranged. And uh, I wanted to hitchhike, so I came to Europe ready to... I had read in, in books, you know, very romantic, uh, you know, reports about how youth traveled here in Europe and the jobs that they picked up along the way. Washing dishes? Wow. <laughs> Picking grapes in the summer? Wow. Uh, babysitting? <clears throat> not really my cup of tea, but uh, uh, yeah, why not? So I came ready to do all that. And I'm so happy to tell you that not once did I have to work in anything else rather than in playing my guitar and singing in those two and a half years which I spent based in Paris, but I traveled around eight countries in Europe and in North Africa, hitchhiking with a tent and haversack and a girlfriend. Uh, I'll come to that later. And uh, playing in underground stations, in the tubes, in the tubes, uh, in the metro stations and and passing my hat around in the restaurants, singing and in, uh, in pedestrian streets. It was lovely. Venice was the best place to sing in, one of the best places to sing in. And yeah, that's what I did. And that's when you also discovered that your nipple was an erogenous zone. <laughs> no, that was that was after I came back from Europe. <laughs> Tell us about the discovery. Uh, Okay. It's in the book. I'm not making this up. Sex maniac is coming. <laughs> anyway, uh, I had discovered it on my own, you know, uh, alone. <coughs> and, uh, and I was embarrassed. I thought there was something wrong with me. You know, I thought my female hormones were stronger than the male. Uh, and I kept it a secret from everybody, especially from my girlfriend. Because uh, until I met my first foreign girlfriend in Goa, she happened to be American, and uh, we went out and uh, we were sitting, doing this thing that Americans called call petting and necking. I guess that's what they call it in the car in the night in the in Donna Paula, which overlooks the Mandavi River and the whole bay and blah blah blah. And the first thing she did when we started to kiss was reach for my nipples. And I said, how come you're doing that? And she said, why? 
Uh, she said, men have, you know, erotic, erogenous nipples as well. I said, really? It's not just, I mean, it's not just me. She said, no, of course not. I was so relieved, I was so relieved. I'm normal, yes, I'm normal. And uh, wow. In case there's any man suffering in silence, please. Tell your wives about it and have a good time tonight. You'll have me and my book to thank for it. But having discovered that, it was just, you know, then you were a serial lover with your black boots, long hair, beard, and guitar. And you experienced as a serial lover across Europe and Africa. I think, I told you, he's a sex maniac. Anyway, um, I think uh, sex is a very important part of life is a very important force that drives us. And that's one thing that we, you know, we don't write about, especially Indians don't write about in our autobiographies, you know, biographies. I think it's so interesting. It's, uh, it's as interesting as knowing what made you make that music, you know, what was the driving force behind it. And, uh, but in India, we are a nation that quietly multiplies and reproduces every few years uh, with one of the highest populations in India. But we don't talk about sex, you see. <laughs> Simply we multiply, but we never talk about sex. I decided to talk about sex. Why not, you know? And especially when I was growing up and how interesting, how fascinating it is, uh, you know, and that's what I try to put across. And, uh, and it's as normal as eating and drinking and sleeping. But that's one thing, it's one thing that differs from country to country, from society to society, culture to culture, religion to religion. So our approach you know, to sex differs very much where we come from and, uh, and which religion we've been brought up believing in. And uh, so in that way, I think it's different from eating. Everybody eats. Everybody as a glass of water, there's no questions asked. But about sex, some societies will frown upon it, ask questions, and the others will not. It'll be easier and freer in some other countries. So I think it's, it's a very important part of who I am, who I was, and how I grew up as a, as a Goan from a Christian family who, who later on decided to to think for himself and uh, so yes, so I wrote a lot of my uh, sexual experiences, but never really in a, in a sex, sex explicit way. It was more about the longings and the desires of a young boy and then the fulfillment of a young man and uh, relationships rather than, I don't think there are any steamy, uh, sexy scenes in the book, are there? I'll, I'll have to pick out the page numbers, but I'll do that later. <laughs> okay. You know, one of the things, Remo, four years you traveled through Europe with your guitar, and you had so many different incidents and memories and conversations and meeting people, some who betrayed you, some who stole from you. But across all of that, there was always your guiding guardian angel who protected you at so many points of time. Tell us a little bit about that. Okay. Because hitchhiking can be very dangerous. Um, this we're talking about between 77 and 78 is when I did, 77 and 80, sorry, when I did my, my hitchhiking and, uh, and busking. Busking, if you don't, for those who don't know, is like I described, playing in underground stations and uh, in restaurants, sometimes having to pass your, your hat around if you wear one. and. Uh, yeah, you can, you know, when you're living out on a tent and, uh, and hitchhiking from unknown people, you come across a lot of different uh, situations and you find yourself in different situations. Uh, like, for example, in, uh, in Algeria, uh, when I took a bus from, uh, from uh, Tunisia to Algeria, uh, we reached Algeria four hours late because of Algerian uh, you know, immigration. And uh, I saw that my, my bag was empty. 
you know, the, the bag which I had slung around my shoulder. So there was no purse, there was no, no passport. The purse was okay because I was earning along the way, you know, I wasn't traveling with a huge amount of money. I was earning as I was traveling, so, so that was not such a problem. And I had my guitar, so, but without a passport in the, in the 1970s, an Indian passport, there was no Indian consulate or embassy in Algeria, first of all. How was I going to travel out of the country or even in the country? And we had landed and we had reached, the bus had uh, dropped us at a square which was at a sunken level from the rest of the city. So there were st stairs going up to the roads which are above the square on, on all four sides. And I started walking around that square shouting like a madman. Uh, not like a madman, but uh, you know, requesting whoever had taken my, my passport. Monsieur, s'il vous plaît, donnez-moi mon passeport. Gardez l'argent, s'il vous plaît. Mais rendez-moi mon passeport, s'il vous plaît. Uh, Mister, please return my passport. Keep the money if you wish, but return it. And I told him, uh, un passeport indien, c'est inutile. Vous ne pouvez pas le vendre. <laughs> you can't sell an Indian passport. C'est pas un passeport. C'est pas un passeport américain. C'est pas un passeport uh, anglais. Rendez-moi mon pauvre passeport indien, s'il vous plaît. Sinon, je suis foutu. Je peux rien faire ici. So please, it's not an American passport. It's not a British passport. Just give me my poor little Indian passport so I can travel and be safe. And I kept on doing that. And my girlfriend was sitting on our luggage and watching me doing that for half an hour. She said, listen, how long are you going to shout like this? It's useless. The whole city is sleeping. sleeping. Let's just go. I said, go where? No, I'm not moving from here. And I kept on doing the rounds of the square. When suddenly there was an object that flew in the night and <laughs> fell at my feet. It was my passport, yes, oh, wow, <laughs> it was my passport. The, the kind robber took pity on me <laughs> on this. No, I really admire his, um, you know, whatever, he might have wanted to rob my money, but uh, he took pity on, on this situation. And uh, well, I had my passport back. And there were lots of other incidents, a uh, loss of tell passport. Them, tell was, them about the sugar cube. Oh, the sugar cube. I was in Paris and uh, my visa had expired. Finally, they wouldn't give me an extension anymore. I had stayed for two years, two and a half years. At that time, you needed visa every time you traveled from one country to the other. So I had exhausted my, uh, my good luck in getting visas for Spain, for Portugal, for England, for here, for there. And, and for getting extensions in the, you know, to, you know, to the French visa. So I decided to just stay on as, as a visa-less person in Paris for a little while. And in the nights, I used to have these nightmares of being stopped because there was a lot of control at that time in Paris, in the metros, and I'm sure there is even now. Uh, I didn't know what I would do if they, asked, if they asked me. And I used to actually wake up sweating in the night, you know, thinking, what would happen. And there I was one morning walking in the, in, in the Parisian metro with the leather boots up till here and my jeans in the boots and uh, I had hair down till here, a beard and uh, an overcoat till my knees almost and uh, earrings. They were just, they had just come into, into fashion for men in Paris and I got my, my ears pierced and uh, when suddenly there were three cops that I could not avoid and they stopped me and they asked me for my papers and I don't know from where this cold, cool attitude came to me at that moment and, uh, and from where this idea came to pretend that I spoke French with a British accent. <laughs> so, so I, I pretended I was not really from there. I said, oh, passeport, passeport, monsieur, mon passeport, ambassade indienne. Uh, ambassade indienne, pourquoi? What, what, uh, revalidité, revalidité. And I'm trying to explain to him as if he's a dumb kid, you know? <laughs> uh, and uh, hitting my 
hand on, on my other hand to show the stamping of the revalidation of the passport. Revalidite, revalidite. And smiling at him sweetly all the, all the time. So he told me, well, you should have a, a paper from the embassy in that case. And I'm pretending I don't understand him. Revalidite, revalidite. So they decide to search me. Uh, so they put their hands in my pockets and in these huge pockets of my overcoat, they found something hard, like a cube. And they said, ha ha, we, we got this guy. They took it out and it was a cube of sugar, <laughs> which uh, I had unconsciously or subconsciously put in my, in my pocket when I went to a cafe and I had a coffee and they had put two cubes of sugar in my, in my saucer instead of one and I used only one, so I put one in my... So they looked at each other, the two cops looked at each other and smiled and said, okay, he's not into drugs, he just has a sweet tooth. <laughs> and, uh, and they said, uh, well, the next time, ask the embassy for a, you know, for a paper, you know. And, and off I went. <sighs> oh my God, after that, I realized what kind of a situation I had been saved from. And that's why I wrote in the, in the book, it does not really reflect any religious beliefs when I wrote a guardian angel, although a guardian angel is something that's very, very common in the Christian and Catholic religion. One always talks about a guardian angel. He's this white angel with wings who is invisible to everybody, but he's there to save you. If you're walking into the street where there's a car coming, he pulls you away from there and stuff like that. But that's not the angel I'm talking about, but I spoke about, there was another time when my girlfriend and I were, hitch were, were hitchhiking in Algeria, or was it Tunisia? And there was this very kind Tunisian who took us to dinner uh, at a nice restaurant, and then told us that we were welcome to sleep in his house. There was only his wife and his mother, and uh, he had a guest room for us. And he gave us the guest room, and he said, uh, and after about uh, half an hour, after we went to sleep, there was knocking on the door. And he said, you know, it's late, so my wife and my mother have gone to sleep. I cannot wake them up because my mother is a heart patient. So if she needs her sleep. So let me sleep in the room. And we didn't want a stranger to come and sleep in the room. He kept us awake the whole night and finally we, he said, listen, it's so cold out here in the court. And it was really cold. In the, it's, a, it's the desert, you know, so the nights were extremely cold. And uh, after some time, he did get into the room because we, we felt guilty keeping him out of his own room in his own house. And he said, I'll sleep on the floor. And he went to the cupboard and he took an extra bed sheet and he slept on the floor. And we said... After some time, it started again. Oh, 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 please, I'm not used to sleeping on the floor. My, uh, my arms are aching, my back is aching, my legs are aching. Just give me a small corner in your bed. He said, no way, no way. Uh, no way at all. And this went on for another half an hour. And again, we started to feel guilty. It's his house, you know. Okay, so my girlfriend went to the end of the bed, which was against the wall, and I went also next to her, and we told him, okay, Mohammed, you can sit, you can sleep on this uh, side of the bed. Thank you, thank you, and he's thanking us, which made us feel even more guilty. He slept there, and he started to snore. When he started to snore, we started to feel really <laughs> safe. After a while, there was a leg coming <laughs> on top of me. Mohammed, Mohammed, wake up, huh, 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 huh. wake up, your leg is on me. Okay, okay, and then he would go to sleep. Half an hour later, his arm would come across me on my girlfriend. Mohammed, Mohammed, get up. And uh, we spent the whole night that way until, until we saw sunshine coming through the curtains. And we looked at the side of the bed, no Mohammed. <sighs> finally, you know, finally. And we got out of bed, we looked in the cupboards to see whether he was hiding there somewhere in the bathroom. No, he wasn't there. We had a shower and we, and we were going to look for him. We met him because he was the local baker and he had a bakery and a pastry shop and we had gone to buy bread. And there he was and he invited us to dinner. He said, oh, I love to meet French people and let's go to, uh, you know, not me, my girlfriend was French. Uh, 
And that's how it all started. The next day, we were so angry, so angry with him. You know, mostly because we felt betrayed by that show of, uh, of friendship, you know. So there was a knock on the door. And we approached the door, ready to blast him out. And we opened the door, and there's and this two beautiful ladies, well, ladies with beautiful eyes, and burkas, and the cover till the top of their noses come in, looking at us with fire and hatred in their eyes, with heavy laden trays with breakfast for us, silver trays. And we realized that they had all this anger and uh, hatred for us because, you know, they didn't know what her husband had been doing with us the whole night. <laughs> God knows what. So we tried to tell them, but they didn't speak any French. We tried to tell, to tell them in English, but they didn't speak any English. They just gave us more dirty looks and walked away. We had breakfast, and we walked down to the, to the town, to the little town under the, uh, at the bottom of the hill where his new house was. And we went to the, to the, to the bakery, and my girlfriend let him have it. He was, he was down in the, in the baking room, and he saw us and he went white. Like the first time I saw somebody literally going white, as if he had seen ghosts. And he tried to keep her quiet. He said, listen, you're ruining my reputation in front of my, uh, my employees here. Please keep it quiet. She took no pity. I don't think he ever invited any, any tourists in for dinner after that. But, uh, but there was this guardian angel who, who protected us from a lot of situations like that. And it's a, it's a, it's a dangerous world. It can be a dangerous world. Because, but uh, we met so many wonderful people that it, 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 was, uh, it more than made up for these guys. And then finally you wanted to come back to India. You just missed Goa and you came back. And that again began a whole new story uh, with different music. So tell us about why you came back, what were you missing? Well, and I, then the musical journey, because I know the way you're going to run out of time very quickly. Well, the first year in Europe was a revelation. You know, everything was a revelation. Each new, uh, forget each new country, each new season was a revelation, it was wonderful. The second year was a great uh, revelation of familiarity, because I knew the seasons then, and I felt, wow, I know this. This country, I know this uh, weather. When the third year started, routine started coming in. And uh, the summer went off fine, but when uh, autumn came, I started to feel a bit depressed, and I started to f miss the sight of coconut trees, of rice fields, of the beaches of Goa, and, uh, and I realized that that's where I wanted to live and travel as much as I could uh, in, in the rest of my life, if I could, if I was able to, but where I wanted to live and where I really belonged was in Goa. And that's what made me come back. And when I went back, I decided, okay, this is where I'm going to settle now, and I'm going to earn my living. Uh, not in a very respectable way as an architect, but doing only things that I love doing. And I actually sat down and made a list of what I loved doing. It was a very simple and short list. It was number one, music, number two, drawing, number three, writing. So in music already I was playing, I was composing songs. In drawing I decided, uh, well, I'm not gonna become a painter and draw pa paintings and have exhibitions. I'll do, do something more commercial, what can I do? And I thought of postcards because there weren't nice enough postcards in Goa at that time. There were lousy photographs and the printing was so bad uh, the green of the coconut trees was in the blue sky and, the, and stuff like that, you know, the printing of the early uh, 80s in Goa was something else. And in writing, well, I just put together the poems I had written right from, right from college and I, uh, and I put out a book of poems. And then eventually music took over everything and it actually encompasses my other two loves, you know, because I write my lyrics, so, 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 so that's writing. And uh, I love drawing, and I used to design my own album covers and stuff like that, so music just took over. And a lot of your mu music continued to be very goan in its, in, its, in its roots, and yet you also crossed over, and you know, Bollywood just loved you, and you started 
creating some fabulous songs, and I know that she's given us a roundup time, but perhaps we can just touch upon that, how that transformed your life as well, and what happened with you know, both the Goan music and the Bollywood music, and then if you would like to play. I was never an exponent of Goan music. I, I did release one album of old Goan songs and old Portuguese songs, which I you know, grew up to in Goa, and which I couldn't find in record shops in Goa anymore. I call that album Old Goan Gold, and it's still one of the favorites, one of my favorite albums among Goans, because Goans love nostalgia. And, uh, but I always, uh, you know, my main body of work was always my compositions, my creations, and uh, Bollywood never attracted me. First of all, I didn't know Hindi well enough to even think, to even have that thought cross my mind about doing Bollywood music. And frankly, at that time, <laughs> I looked down upon Bollywood music <coughs> because uh, music directors at that time used to have bass guitarists who would play wrong notes. They were there just to, preserve, just to provide the low frequency boom, 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 boom. It didn't matter on what chord or what, or, or, or what key they played. Uh, the compositions were beautiful Indian melodies, but the Western instruments that, that played along with them, I don't know, it was just another, it wasn't my cup of tea. Then when the first, uh, the first Bollywood offer came to me, I'm sitting in Goa, quietly, not interfering with anybody, and uh, Sham Benegal called up and asked me to do music for Trikal. And in the same year, Gulanan called up and asked me to do music for Jalwa. Now these are two totally, uh, you know, two films in totally different. Uh, so mainstream, genres. mainstream, and what was then known as art cinema, the parallel cinema. Yeah, Trikal okay. was a very art film kind of film, <laughs> and the Jalwa was a very uh, masala and action kind of film. Uh, right to the extent that it was a copy of the, I believe it was a copy of the. Uh, Beverly Hills Cops, yeah, which I never saw, unfortunately. I must see the Beverly Hills Cops, see what it was copied from. But the music that I did in both became hits in India. Jalwa in the commercial genre and the music for Trikal in the art film genre. And, uh, but still, I never moved to Bombay and tried to make a, a career out of films, out of film music. It was always my own songs that interested me more. So I did a few songs for films after that over the years and luckily for me they became huge hits and uh, what film music gave me was exposure my god i did one film in one commercial for one song in one commercial film jalwa and i had been you know doing my own songs in english for years and years and uh, uh, and i was known by a niche audience in india those who listened to music in english and the next time I went to Mumbai, after I did Jalwa, I was in a taxi and at, uh, at the traffic lights where the street urchins come and wipe your, uh, your windscreen for a few coins from the taxi driver, the urchin saw me and said, Jalwa, Jalwa! Because I also appeared in the film for a few seconds. You blink and you miss me, that kind of thing. And that made me realize the power of Indian cinema. You know, it was amazing. Just a few seconds on... I'm exaggerating, maybe a few minutes on the screen, and I was being recognized by street urchins in, in Bombay. Whereas, but even that didn't tempt me to go full time. So I was really lucky that the few songs that I did in Indian films were huge hits, like Pyar Toh Hona Itha and uh, Hamma Hamma and, uh, and O Meri Munni, which was my own Hindi album, finally. I was lucky. I was lucky about that. And, Okay, so we've got a sign to... Any questions? Uh, we'll take a couple of questions and then... Anything? One at the back? Uh, if you... Yeah. Hi. Hi. Use in uh, Target magazine, if, if anybody remembers those from the 80s. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't Target understand. magazine. He's, he's read, oh, read your interviews with yes. Target yeah, magazine. Yeah, 
Um, so my question, and I hope it, it doesn't come across wrong, is um, I recently uh, re-listened to Oh Miri Munni. Um, and how well do you think has that song aged in terms of its lyrics? How long has it ha aged? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, you're talking about Omeri Munni, right? Yes. Yeah. I, I wrote Omeri Munni when uh, there were a few incidents. But, by the way, thank you for not asking about nipples. Uh, <laughs> that's uh, in Sanjoy's domain. Uh, uh, I wrote Omeri, Omeri Munni when... Uh, there were two or three incidents in India which showed me that there was a sexual revolution beginning with the youth, you know, with, with young girls, 12 and 13 year old girls who suddenly were much freer than I was when I was a schoolboy. Uh, you'll read about the, about the incidents in the book, by the book. Uh, I won't tell you what they were right now because it'll take too long. But that's what made me write that song as a warning to the youth saying that, hey, take a few more years, a couple, just a couple more years with your Barbie doll at home, you're a bit too young, you're only 13, stop hitching high, you know, stop hitching up your skirt and puffing out your blouse of your school uniform and going out to discos, just spend a few more years until you mature a little more because it's not only, you know, by that time it wasn't just the danger of pregnancy or of, uh, or, or of, uh, you know, venereal diseases anymore. This killer AIDS had come out, had just come out. So that's the kind of advice I was giving. And I think, I think that advice always stands good for, for, for youth who experiment with sex before they know enough about it and uh, get into trouble because of it. The trouble can be a pregnancy, can be AIDS, can be anything. I, I'm assuming you all want him to uh, sing a little bit because otherwise... I, so let's not take any more questions and... Come on, if you all want him to sing, you need to... Thank you. To, to thank you for having had the patience to listen to a singer yap, 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 yap for so long and, and so patiently sing a few songs, just bits of songs which... Is the guitar on? Yeah. Yes, now it's on. Shana to her bus at 13. Oh, Mary Mooney. Mooney, Mooney, baby. Oh, Mary Mooney. Mooney, Mooney, baby. 
no one can finish a song or a medley without some Goan music. This one is not really from Goa, but there were three Portuguese colonies in India, Goa, Daman, and Diu. Daman and Diu were in, in Gujarat. It's pretty far across Maharashtra in Gujarat. And Goa was, uh, well, in Goa. Goa was the main colony, the, <clears throat> the seat of Portuguese power in, in India. And uh, from Goa, they governed these little pockets of the colonies in Gujarat, the Man and Diu. In those days, with their telephones hardly worked, forget internet. And it was amazing how it all worked. And the times were different. So there's this beautiful song from Daman, which is students from Daman who lived in Panjim in a, in a guest house or in a hostel, student's hostel, which was across our street, used to sing on the evenings when they felt very nostalgic for home in that quiet city without much traffic, with dim street lights. We could hear them without amplification from their uh, balcony, from their veranda in our house. And uh, I made my own version of this song some time back and it became a huge hit. And I believe no go and wedding or go and party is complete without them playing this song. Oh, Maria Pitache, oh, Maria Pitache, oh, Maria Pitache, oh, Maria Pitache, oh, Maria Pitache. Oh Maria Pitache, oh Maria Pitache, oh Maria Pitache, we are Barra da Dama, oh mi luzi, estreti comprid, Barra da Dama, oh mi luzi, estreti comprid. Alegre na entrada, me luzi e triste na saída. Alegre na entrada, me luzi e triste na saída. Por amor da voz, me luzi e eu fico saudade. Por amor da voz, me luzi e eu fico saudade. Fazer a sentinela, me luzi e leva a chicota. Fazer a sentinela, me luzi e leva a chicota. Oh Maria Pitache, oh Maria Pitache, oh Maria Pitache, hey, oh Maria Pitache, oh Maria Pitache, oh Maria Pitache, oh Maria Pitache, hey, oh Maria Pitache, we are. That song was in Portuguese, by the way, but in a Portuguese in a dialect of Portuguese which is only spoken and only understood by the people of Daman. Nobody else understands it. Nobody else understands all the words and the way they say Neither do the Brazilians, neither do the Goans really understand every word of their songs, and particularly not the Portuguese. <laughs> but you can feel the fire they have in their music. And uh, the Goan music itself has also has the same kind of rhythm. And I'd like to finish this little medley uh, with a go on a folk song which yesterday somebody told me somebody from Sri Lanka a lady from Sri Lanka from Sri Lanka told me that she heard this go on music and my god I, I felt I was listening to to you know, Sri Lankan baila music and that's what the goans do when they hear Sri Lankan baila music they say my god it sounds like go on music <laughs> it's so similar it's so similar the beat the feel the whole thing behind the music is so similar. The Goan Mando used to start with a very plaintive and slow verse or slow song, which was a bit reminiscent of the Fado, but not quiet because it was in a 6-8 uh, rhythm being Goan and Indian, whereas Fado is usually 4-4. But there was the same pathos the fact that it was all about broken hearts, broken love affairs, broken loves, and uh, sometimes about fulfilled love as well. But beautifully written, beautiful poetry. But, uh, and, and that slow bandha was always followed by uh, dulpods. Dulpods were these little verses or these little couplets, totally uh, disconnected from each other, composed by different composers at different times, and these couplets, 
were gossip or stories about what happened in the villages. Like for example, what, what one neighbor's cock did to the other neighbor's hens and uh, how one neighbor had children, had a child every year, gave birth to a child every year for 10 years while her poor husband was working on a ship for the last 20 years. And uh, little interesting stories like that, you know. But very village uh, folkloric uh, things. Do I have time to sing a, a verse of the Mando and the Dulpods, or should I just go into I mean, the Dulpods? Just one, because we need to, we've got the stand up after, so okay. just one of them. Okay, so just the. I'm sorry, one more. Oh, one oh only one of them. Then I, I'll choose the, 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 the Dulpods, they're always more interesting. <laughs> Undram mucha mama, ani amo Santa Tuca. Undram mucha mama, ani amo Santa Tuca. Ani mazori chapila la gife no madila. Ani mazori chapila la gife no madila. Undir mama I know, ani bache pana liplo. Undir mama I know, ani bache pana liplo. Ani mazori chapila na takaiya na sanhaila. This is the one about the children. She's counting how many children is that. Ek don tin char pan so pandra sola ek baile cho go na gara burgin jani pandra sola ek don tin char pan so pandra sola ek baile cho go na gara burgin jani pandra sola farar far satai ranangu farar far satai ranangu far you like to learn Konkani like in three seconds? Okay. All you've got to say is ya, ya, maya, ya. Four seconds, sorry. Is that all right? Can you say it? I want to hear you say it. Ya, ya, maya, ya. Beautiful. Now you've got to say it with the melody and with the rhythm and with clapping your hands. Okay, are you ready? I won't tell you what it means. It means because it means... Just, just a minute, just a minute. Sorry, I didn't stop talking. It means let's go. Maya, let's go. But please don't go because the greatest show of them all is coming up here. Shashi Tarur is going to be the stand-up comedian in a while. And, uh, but before that, we just sing this and pretend it doesn't mean let's go, okay? Yeah, yeah, Maya, yeah. Now the melody and the beat is like this. Yeah, yeah, Maya, yeah. Yeah, yeah, my yeah, 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 my yeah, 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 only you now. I feel I'm in Goa, the only thing missing is some cashew penny here. Really. My God, you're a beautiful audience. Okay, now we're gonna do it together. Now we're gonna do it together before he stops us. One, two, three, yeah, yeah, my yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, my yeah, 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 my yeah, 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 my yeah, yeah, my yeah, 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 my yeah, and we go faster at the end. Yeah, yeah, my yeah, 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 my yeah, 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 my yeah, 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 faster, faster, faster. Yeah, yeah, my yeah, 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 my yeah, 
JLF and Viva British Library. Thank you very much, Liz. And Viva you, all of you. Thank you, you lovely audience. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. We're just going to clear the stage and then we're going to have Shashi on. Hello. Mic, please. So after Shashi finishes, we'll have Remo signing his books at the bookstore. For those of you who want to buy his books, there's got some. I'll read the rest of his story. Remo Fernandez, thank you so much for being here with us at the closing session. Whatever you did, if it wasn't good enough, you needed to try and do better and keep at it. Actually, village life produces the philosophical ideas that are germane to democratic thought and practice. I mean, just losing four of your bandmates, soulmates is bad enough. But the worst thing is out of those four families, two of the families blamed me. But the progress from 1991 to 2017, I think, only took India to a better place. It was really through the uh, th through the transition into politics that I uh, that I had the good luck of becoming a writer.